sort of law. <laughs> Do not make any purchasing decisions based on this presentation. So let's talk about CSS and the design system. Now, I know probably a lot of you remember a couple of years ago when we launched Salesforce One. And with that, we also took a big step towards a living style guide. And it was a really great first step. Um, last year, not this year, but last year at Dreamforce, my team got to talk to hundreds of partners <coughs> and customers about this new style guide. And some of the things we heard were, how do I get my app to look like this? And we know that many of the partners and, and uh, people that work with Salesforce really want their apps to fit in and, and look like Salesforce does, but we didn't give them all the resources to get there. And we also sir, heard, can I use the CSS in my app? We found out partners were reverse engineering the CSS to try to match our style, you know how to uh, inspect and, and view and grab the styles. And, but let's be honest, who wouldn't rather have a really good just copy paste? Who wants to inspect and try to pull all that out? So we had definitely made progress, but we weren't quite there. And internally, we really want to empower our designers to design and iterate more efficiently in the browser. That's a big goal that we have in Salesforce UX. We do, we have a really interesting process. I've been there since January, and I've been really amazed to see the amount of iterating, rapid prototyping, and then testing with real users, iterating some more. Um, so we wanted to allow our prototypers to really very quickly iterate these designs that our um, designers came up with. But our style guide was very static, and it didn't <coughs> contain the tools they needed to empower them. What we needed was a more complex, complete living design system. And we wanted to make that design system really robust and powerful. So the new Lightning design system is comprised of design patterns. We have CSS and markup icons, custom font, color swatches. We have a mobile SDK. And we're adding other resources all the time that both internal developers and external partners and developers can take advantage of. And I'm sure everybody's quite aware of the Lightning experience since Dreamforce. It was an amazingly well thought out, huge change. It's not all UI based. There's a lot of behind the scenes uh, stuff that has happened with data. But the part that we are involved in is the UI portion. And you can imagine what a huge task it is to keep all these designers and developers on the same page, hundreds of engineers. Um, so th this was a, a, really, a really big undertaking. Um, so we set out to build the CSS portion of the design system as a living spec. And it will evolve as the Salesforce platform evolves. So with design system components, we eliminate the need for redline specs. That's how our uh, designers had been doing everything. All these red lines with lots of little marks. And we're trying to get rid of that so that they can reference actual code. And yes, even copy and paste. It's very exciting. Our framework consists of three parts. We have dependencies, or which can, uh, consist of tokens. We have objects and components. These are lightweight and modular and reusable. A little different than you might think of when you hear lightning components. Um, these are components in our UI library. And then we have utilities, which are non-semantic, single-purpose classes that give you added ability. So in our design system site, the component menu is where you'll find the CSS framework. And uh, this is the site. You'll notice there are many, many components. And then down the bottom of, you, of the components, you'll see utilities. And the utilities are basically where we have all those added extra little things. Now, in Salesforce, we have four design principles. And this is the way our Salesforce UX, our design system, and everything runs. They are clarity, efficiency, consistency, and beauty. And those are in order. So we want to make sure that the most important thing is clarity, and then we move through the list. And that's how we make decisions about everything we do. So these same principles help to uh, guide our framework as well. So let's look at how clarity affected our decisions. So Clarity says we want to eliminate ambiguity, enable people to see, understand, and act with confidence. Anyone who's worked with CSS may already be struggling with the idea of clarity in CSS. What does that even mean? Well, for us, our classes are very explicit, and we use very few abbreviations. And yes, it does make it a little more verbose, 
Um, but it's also a lot easier for someone to come in who is not familiar with the entire framework and understand. Then naming is another way we try to make things clear. And if you haven't heard of BIM naming, uh, BIM stands for Block Element Modifier. And it makes it very easy for a group of developers working on the same project to understand the class immediately when they see it. So let's look at what BIM is in case uh, some of you haven't heard of it yet. Let's pretend we're building a component and our component is called house. So this is the block or the component name. And then we have an element or a component part and that's separated with two underscores. So the house has a door. This is a part of our house. Then we have a modifier which is separated with two dashes. So our house is red. So we know that this dash means that that is modifying our component. And we can also have variations of component parts. So we could say house has a door and the door is white. So that's a variation on a component part. And once you really get used to this system, it's so much easier to just look at a component and understand what all these classes are doing. The other thing that it does is it helps us to keep our code base flat. We keep it as flat as possible. We use very little um, descendant selectors. We try to keep things very simple you will not find important, you will not find us overriding, overriding, overriding. We try to opt into things rather than opt out. Keeps our specificity down and keeps it more maintainable. So what about documentation? We love documentation, but you can ask Brandon. We do not love writing it, we don't. But we do love the results of having good documentation and we're working very hard on making this better all the time. So let me show you what we're providing at this point. So we'll look at the button component. Um, the first thing we have for each component is uh, a section that kind of talks about what is this component. It gives you whatever information you need. Then we'll have a section about accessibility. If there's something that has to do with JavaScript, you'll also have that there. Each component starts with a base state. And that is just the least uh, complex version. We show the uh, HTML and the SAS. And then it will go to the next variant. We'll have buttons clearly have a lot of, um, a lot of variants. The variants are, uh, well, the buttons themselves, I don't think you can even see that, but when you hover, the button hovers as a button would. If you click on it, it focuses like a button would. Anything that happens with CSS will happen right here. And then all the variants are listed there on the right side. And at the very bottom of each component, we have a component overview chart. Um, since there are so many different states with buttons and icon buttons, that's quite a lot of button, button information. But it starts with the class. What happens when you add that class? Is it required? What do you apply it to? And then any comments for anything extra, additional caveats, specific use cases, et cetera. Um, so now that we've talked a little bit about how clarity relates, let's talk about our next principle, which is efficiency. Efficiency says streamline and optimize workflows, intelligently anticipate needs to help people work better, smarter, and faster. So how does that relate to CSS? We started the process by doing an audit and an inventory of all the components in our designer's lightning comp. So you can imagine as lightning was being designed and, and different teams everywhere were designing different pieces of it, in the end, can you imagine how many font sizes we might have found when we did our inventory? I don't, I don't have the actual number, it was a lot. <laughs> um, and then what we do is we go back and we go through and we say, actually, we should only have five font sizes. They should act in this manner. They should fit onto this, you know, things should fit onto this kind of grid. The blues should be this blue and, you know, these variations. And so we, we make these um, design patterns and then we take the design system that has pulled the patterns out, we go back to the designers, and then they update their comps so that everybody is on the same page and everything is using the spacing, the font sizes, the colors. Um, we standardize and align all these designs. And this, in turn, allows us to build much more efficient CSS, much smaller. So as we inventoried each component, we were able to identify pieces, little patterns, that make up the components themselves, little reusable bits. And we began by building the smallest pieces, 
and then we combine those to create the larger components. So let's look at one of our more common um, uses. This is a media object. A media object is simply a figure and text sitting side by side. It's a very common pattern in an application. The base media object is simply the text at the top, and the object can be an SVG, an icon, an image, a movie. The centered media object puts the centered text next to the object. This is reversed, so we have a lot of different variants. And then this pattern is used in lots of other things. For instance, in tiles. We have tiles that have icons that use this media object pattern. Tiles that have actions, badges. So you can see the pattern is used in many, many places in the application. We also have larger things like um, the activity timeline that uses a lot of our different little pieces and patterns. You can see that we actually have the media object there, but we also have a lot of different inline lists and a variety of other little patterns that are all comprised into this large um, bit. So let's talk about enterprise applications, because they are different, as you know, from building a regular web page. We found some very unique traits as we went through into these inventories. Um, with content, enterprise applications demand data-rich interfaces. They don't have the vertical rhythm that you see on a regular web page, right? You're, you want to put beautiful, content into your UI, but your, your user is wanting to get a lot of things done, not see beautiful white space, right? So we found that our headings and our paragraphs rare, rarely have any margin below them, so we removed it by default. Um, and that's not all we learned about headings. In a framework, we don't know how you plan to use headings. We can't anticipate that when you put that component into the page, it should be an H1, an H3, an H5, whatever the semantic accessible heading should be. And we want to encourage developers to really use the proper heading level, not use the H3 because that looks like it's about the right size for what I need right here. No, 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 don't do that. So for that reason, we equalized all our headings to be the same size as our base font size, which is 16 pixels. Um, then we created text utility classes for the I think it's four or five different text heading looks that we have in the app. And you simply use the proper level of heading for your, your portion of the app. And then you put a class on that gives it the, the look and the style that you want. Let's look at how lists are used in Enterprise. They're usually used for their semantics and they're rarely used with list markers. So it's usually a big list of data. So we took away all markers and padding and margin. And I know that probably sounds really odd. Now I have uh, headings with no margin. I have lists that don't look like lists. But we provided a way for you to opt back in. So let's say you're building something that needs to have a heading and, and a vertical rhythm. You can either, if it's something simple, you can add one of the utility classes to put a little padding a margin under or over something. Or you can wrap an entire section of content in a class that we've given you that opts everything in there back into the normal styling. And I'll show you what that looks like. So here you can see I have a heading, some paragraphs, a list. You can see them in the code better. But those are actually those things. But here it's just all kind of crammed together, right? So we're going to put on the class of SLDS text long form. And then you can see that what happens is everything looks like, let's say you're building a discussion, you, be, you get all your, your um, margins and spacing and list markers back in. So at Salesforce, accessibility is a directive. All people, all devices, because accessibility isn't just for people. The things you do for accessibility also help people on different devices as a wonderful side effect. I personally love this about Salesforce because I've always had a, a place in my heart for accessibility and the belief that all people should, should use the web. It should be the great equalizer. So we have baked accessibility in. Where semantics matter, we have used the proper elements. Uh, we've put ARIA roles on our components. Sizing is defined in REM units. And so that users who increase their base font size have a, a zoomed experience. And if you're not familiar with REM units, 
One rem unit is based on the HTML font size. So if you don't change that, that's 16 pixels. We size all of our components using that same rem unit. So when someone comes in, let's say they have super low vision, and they've upped their base font size to 32 pixels. When they come into this application, everything sizes up so that they have the same kind of rhythm as would be expected. You're not getting things wrapping. Now, I've heard this fabulous argument, but wait, they can just zoom. When they zoom, everything zooms. The browser takes care of that. Not if they change their base font size. Try it when you get home. If you change your base font size and you go into an application or web page that is sized in pixels, the font will be big, but everything else will be the size it's supposed to be. And people with low vision rarely zoom. They typically use things to change their base to start with. I have an aunt who has lupus and she has super thick glasses and she uses kind of a, she has her, her font set as high as possible and then she uses like this thing that, that magnifies the screen. Watch someone like that use the web and then tell me you don't care about how it works. I mean, it, it needs to work for everybody. And then, even though we don't have JavaScript in the framework currently, we have documented what you need to do for JavaScript, or with JavaScript to keep your, your component accessible. We also love consistency. Consistency says we create familiarity and strengthen intuition by applying the same solution to the same problem. And this is how it uh, works into the CSS framework. The basic atoms of our design system are design tokens. And those are simply variables or constants that represent a specific value. We provide them for a large number of, uh, a huge number of properties. And what this means is when our developers and when you as developers, as they get these into liking components, when you use a token or you're using SAS and, and Salesforce it changes the blue slightly in one release, you're, you will get that change automatically. Your component will keep up with the look that Salesforce has, even if color or spacing or something has changed. Now during the audit I mentioned earlier, we were able to identify common values, which we created tokens out of, and then our designers use those tokens to show how these components should be built. They spec them using the tokens rather than absolute values. Now what if you want to brand your app a little bit differently? We use SAS and tokens, which in SAS are variables, and if you have the need to say, you know, our, our brand button is blue. Let's say you're building something for a client and they have green as their overall color. You can change the variables right there, recompile the SAS, and actually change the look, but keep the, the structure that we have already. So let's look at where you can find the tokens. In our design system, there's a section called resources on the left, and you can see design tokens there. We have all the categories of things we have tokens for, and then on the left there is the token name that you would use in your uh, development and an example of what the color or the spacing or whatever is. And if you are familiar with SAS, you'll recognize these tokens. These are actually just SAS variables. Whether you're using SAS or not, every developer knows that writing CSS, usually the most frustrating part of CSS is the C, right? the cascade, we play well with others. We have taken the time to try to make our framework so that you can mix it with your own custom CSS, you can mix it with other frameworks if you need to, maybe you're transitioning out of the bootstrap that was made years ago that's kind of gotten out of date and you're trying to move your components into this new lighting look, but you don't want to just rip it all out, right? So you can little by little change and mix us if you need to. So what we do is, rather than using a class name like button, which would be very common, we've used SLDS button. So all of our class names start with SLDS so that you can mix them with anything. Due to the variety of environments that the design system has to play in, we also have several scoped files that will take it one step further. So scoping is what you do 
when your component is in an environment where you can't control the entire DOM, so you're not building your own uh, application, you're building maybe a Visual Force page that is playing with Visual Force's CSS, maybe you are building lightning components or things that are going to go to lightning out now. When that happens, we can actually provide a scoped file for you. And the way this helps is that you've got your div, or it can be the top level of your component, and you put the SLDS class on it. Oh, dear, that wasn't good. You're doing. It can wrap a bunch of things, or it can be one component. You put a class on SLDS, okay? And that wraps all your stuff. And the reason this helps is because for example, Visual Force is an older piece of technology, right? And it has this style sheet that has a lot of very specific selectors in it. So they have a style, uh, um, a rule that says UL, LI, and then it's like margin left 40 pixels or whatever it is, right? So if we write you know, UL or LI, we keep everything flat, and we say zero, they override it. But once we have it classed with SLVS, and then it's an LI, and we say margin left zero, we override because this class, of the scoping class, gives us more specificity. Does that make sense? So that's the reason scoping is good. So if you're in Lightning Components, and you must scope, um, and if you're in Visual Force, you must scope because Lightning Components need for your uh, component CSS to be kept out of SFX, out of Lightning Experience. So it keeps them safe. In Visual Force, it helps us to give you some classes that give you the looks that you want. Um, that's essentially how it works. Um, I think we're so close to done. Oh, is it maybe? It looks different. I like that. Oh, I've never broken a complete system before. This is a first. I feel special. You are special. <laughs> okay, so I can tell you this. I don't know why it's not even letting me see it. So we have in our download, we have three scope files. One of them ends in dash VF. Guess which one that's for? Good job. We have one that ends in dash LTNG. Yes. And then we have one just called Scope, and that's so that no matter what other framework you might want to mix with or your own bespoke uh, CSS, you can use that Scope file if you want to. Um, so, hold on. Let me see if there's anything else you need to see anyway. Maybe I can just tell you everything. Okay, our last principle is beauty. Um, and what we've done to really try to make beauty a thing because how many of you have to deal with mobile and different all different sizes of everything right so we are using SVGs so that we have um, scalable vector graphics they've been around forever they're just becoming a real big thing I think the retina screens and things like that have really helped to make people realize well we had this thing we could have been using but we never really have been using very much so we have a consistent crisp look for our icons at any resolution and we have instructions on how to use them. We use icon sprites. And so on the icon page itself where you choose your icons, and then there's also an icon component that tells you how to pull it all together. We also wanted beauty in all our form factors. So we want our components to render well at any, any width. So most of our components have no width placed on the component itself. The width is, got, uh, is achieved by whatever container you put them in. So their parent container, you know, the activity fee that I showed you earlier could be put in a very narrow sidebar or it could be put in a really wide part of the page and it's going to look good both pay, uh, places. Um, heights are rarely used on things. We might use a max height or a min height, but we rarely use a hard, fast height, and one of the reasons for that is accessibility and localization. As soon as you make three containers look fabulous next to each other, and then they get turned into German or Italian or Russian or whatever, and boom, everything's busted out of its, of its bounds. So we, we actually um, use Flexbox, 
for our grids, and that's a really good way to make three containers that are the same height. So there are a lot of good ways to do things without setting absolute heights. So we want to provide a way for you guys to create beautiful apps. I had a great demo showing how easy it was, just copy and paste, yeah. dang it. So I can't show you that. Um, but it, it, was, it was cool, it was really cool. I'll, I'll give you my, my slides. Um, Via, via these guys. Um, the design system is at lightningdesignsystem.com and you can hit the download page and grab everything there. We also are an open source project, so we are on GitHub under uh, salesforce-ux and then slash design-system. Um, we encourage you to contribute or file issues for us there. Um, don't file a lot of it, no. <laughs> issues are great and people, you know, we are in beta, so, you know, put it through its paces and let us know what you find. We do actually welcome that. Um, and then, I was going to give you a link to some Flexbox resources for those of you that are not up to speed on Flexbox, because it is kind of a new, a new way to build things. We have our grids, media objects, inline lists, um, and a few other things that use um, a lot of Flexbox. So there, in my slides, there are a couple of great resources for that. And then there is Trailhead. And you go to the developer section of Salesforce, and we have some Lightning Design System modules there. So you can get up to speed and learn there. Um, and that is it. Thank you very much. I apologize. <laughs> I blew up the system. <laughs>